But it's been absolutely fantastic to be with you. And great presence of God here tonight. How many of you know God's here? And the Bible says, where two or three gather in his name, he's there. You know, I was just reflecting about these seats. Um, they bring back a memory. And I'll just, I'll just, <laughs> I just thought I'd tell you uh, before I just shared some thoughts. When I was um, five years old, as I said on Sunday, my mother got dr dramatically saved and started dragging me to a Pentecostal church. And my father wasn't saved. And we lived with my um, auntie and uncle because we, they couldn't afford to buy a house by themselves. So they bought a house as couples. And so I, I grew up um, in a very loving environment in the sense that um, when my mum wasn't there because she had to work, I had my auntie. And my auntie's now 92 years old. I visit her at least uh, once every three weeks, mainly because she's a great cook. And I go there and she's amazing. But um, so we were living together. Mum got saved, but dad didn't get saved till he was about 72. Very stubborn man. But he used to love, you know, putting a, a wedge between me, me and my mother. And one day I, I got upset with my mother. I was seven years old. And I said to mum, I'm not coming to your church anymore. I'm going to go with my cousin who, she was the daughter of my uncle and auntie. And she went to a Catholic church. Not that God can't be found in Catholic churches, believe me. Anyway, so I went to with her and much, I was very stubborn and, you know, held my head up high. My dad was, you know, he was really stirring me up, said, yeah, don't go to that stupid church where your mother goes, go with your cousin. So I went and I'm sitting in church and I thought, oh boy, I thought that church was boring. This one's even worse, you know. <laughs> and uh, so I started counting all the bricks just like this, it's, it's, I started counting all the bricks. And then I thought, oh dear, okay, what do I do now? And then this, this really weird thought came over me. I thought, I wonder if I could put my head between the pews. See, this is what reminded me tonight. So there I was, <laughs> I'm looking at the bricks, I'm, looking, I'm thinking, this is deja vu. I'm thinking, I'm going back in time. And before I knew it, I don't know what made me do it, I was seven years old. I just put my head between the pews. Now, here's the problem. I got my head in easy, but I couldn't get my head out because my ears got stuck. And so all of a sudden, my cousin, but, but there was a lady sitting you know, in front of me, and when she saw my head pop out, she nearly went through the roof. She thought, what's going on here? And then my cousin's like, get your head out. And I'm there, I, I can't. So she's pulling, the other lady's pushing. Anyway, I disrupted the whole meeting. The, the minister had to stop and he just said, can somebody help that naughty boy? Anyway, that pushing and pulling. Eventually I popped out and there I stood and he just gave me this glare and I just shrunk in my seat. Do you know the funny thing about it? It was the first time I heard God speak to me. Isn't that weird? And you might say, was it an audible voice? No was this sweet, gentle voice just to my spirit. It said, I don't want you to come here, I want you to go with your mother. Do you know, when I got home, I was the most submitted, humble child that you could ever meet. I just said to my cousin, please don't tell, don't tell, you know, mum what happened. And that was a bit of a turnaround for me. And God started speaking to me from a very, very early age. Don't underestimate, underestimate even what you're doing, what you did today, with those superhero kids, God can speak at a very early age, and uh, I think that's great. Tonight, I just want to share with you one of my favourite psalms, Psalm 126. If you have a Bible, could you turn to it? Um, <clears throat> the reason I want to share this thought with you tonight is because of Easter. You know, on Sunday, I spoke a message about, do you know... Um, we have an incredible opportunity this Easter. Let us not just hear, but let us listen. Let us not just look, but let us see the opportunities that God has for us. And the reason I, I want to share Psalm 126 with you tonight, because it's, it's, a, it's actually a redemption song. 
and uh, a very, very powerful redemption songs. There were 15, there's 15 um, in, in the book of Psalms that are songs about the redemptive power of Jesus Christ. And this is one of them. And um, we believe that the author was Ezra. And um, he wrote this song because the children of Israel had been in captivity for 70 years under Babylonian rule. And um, now God delivers them. Aren't you glad, glad that God delivers us? God delivered them and brought them back to Jerusalem, to Zion, the city of God. And um, this is what was penned. Let me read it to you. And then we're going to look at some things that are really amazing about this passage, about the song. It says, When the Lord brought back the captives to Zion, to Jerusalem, we were like men who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said amongst the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we were filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the streams of Negev. Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. This is redemption's song. Do you know, uh, we we've all were in exile without Jesus Christ. How many of you know that? We we're all in captivity. But something happens when you get redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And you know, this weekend that's coming, can I just have the next slide up? It's really interesting because... There's some things we can learn, and we're going to look at this in a minute. But, you know, Friday really talks about death. We remember about the death of Jesus Christ. The disciples thought when Jesus died, they'd lost hope. They were disappointed. They were in despair. They were in grief. They were in sorrow. But how many of you know that the story doesn't end there? There was a Sunday. There was a resurrection Sunday. And friends, let me tell you, if Jesus just died for our sins, we would not have been fully redeemed. But Jesus didn't just die for our sins. He rose again. He resurrected so we could have eternal life. Can you give him a hand of praise tonight? Could you do that? And you know what? So Sunday... What does Sunday talk about? Sunday talks about life. It talks about dreams. It talks about laughter. It talks about praise. It talks about reaping, restoring. Those of us that sowed in tears will reap in joy. This, this particular passage uh, really highlights four things that I want to just look at very, very quickly tonight. Do you know, when you believe that Jesus Christ is our saviour, and when you believe he is Lord, you enter in under his redemptive grace that redeems us. And all of a sudden, we become like these people that came back to Zion. This is what happens in redemption. Number one, we dream again. You know, without God, life's a nightmare. Without God, life's a nightmare. And there's a lot of people today that are living... A nightmare. They're, they're carrying all sorts of pain and disappointments. But when you come to Jesus Christ and you experience his redemptive power, let me tell you, he turns your nightmare into dreams. These people started dreaming again. All of a sudden, as they came back to the, the city of God, Jerusalem, they started dreaming again. And I don't know about you, but do you know one of the greatest things that I've seen as a pastor, one of the things that I love is when people get saved and God starts restoring them. They come in like with a heavy cloud of darkness around them and all of a sudden they start to dream again. Can we believe that when people get saved and walk through these doors, that they're going to experience that loving power of Jesus Christ. They're going to start dreaming again. Here's the second thing that happened that happened to these people. They started to laugh again. Man, I'll tell you what, isn't it amazing? I don't know if you've ever been through grief and sorrow. It's a terrible place to be. But there's something about laughter. This laughter wasn't just circumstantial laughter. This was laughter that came from joy. These people experienced joy. When we get redeemed, we don't just laugh because of circumstances around us, something externally stimulated, but there's an inner joy that causes us to laugh. There's like a fountain of joy that comes within us, and that's what happens through redemption. These people began to dream again, and they began to laugh again. Wow. 
I want to be in that sort of a church. Do you? A place where we can dream, a place where we can laugh. And the third thing, it says this, they began to praise again. It says, then they said amongst the nations, the Lord has done great things amongst us. I want to tell you something. God has done great things in my life. Has he done great things in your life? When we receive that redemptive love of Jesus Christ, let me tell you, we don't just start dreaming again. We don't just start laughing again, but we start praising again and worshipping You know, tonight, I could sense the Spirit of God in this place, and I think we could have just worshipped, because our God is great. And you know what? He hasn't finished yet. He's going to continue to do great things for us. The third thing that I really love, sorry, the fourth thing that I really love, is it says this. It says that we will come back. Those that have sown in tears will reap in joy. We will reap. People that get redeemed start reaping. Do you know, I I guarantee you that there are people in this place tonight, you have wept for certain situations. You've wept. There's been times that you've wept in prayer. But the promise of Jesus Christ is this, that when we come under his redemptive power, when we come under his saving power as saviour, but also his lordship, All the tears that have been shed in prayer, one day there's going to come a reaping. And there's going to come a reaping. Do you know what? I was blessed to meet this pastor tonight who who started this church. I guarantee you that there's been a lot of sowing in tears for this church. The reaping's going to come. Can you believe it? The reaping's going to come. And, um, you know, don't be discouraged. Sometimes you think to yourself, Lord, I've prayed and I've prayed and I've prayed and I've soaked pillows and I've soaked hankies. But one day, if you stay under the redemptive power of Jesus Christ, not only will your reaping come, it'll come in sheaves, in bundles. And some of you, I know, you're believing for things. Some of you, you haven't seen the breakthroughs yet. But let me tell you, we live under resurrection life. We live under the resurrection life of Jesus Christ. And he doesn't throw our, pray- our prayers away. He doesn't throw our tears away. Actually, he actually bottles them and pours out his anointing over situations that seem so difficult. As a pastor, I've been pastoring since I was uh, 21 years. I was 21 years old when I went to full-time ministry. It's a long time. And over the years, I have seen some incredible miracles. I have seen this. I have seen when people have come broken into our churches. People that their life started off as a dream but turned into a nightmare. I've seen people lose hope. I've seen people come with such darkness, bondage over their life. But when they receive Jesus as saviour and they surrender their life to his lordship, he begins to restore them. And you just watch them grow and they begin to dream and laugh and praise and you begin to hear stories that now they are reaping. I want to share one of those stories with you tonight because it's one of the most powerful things that we witnessed. It's just one of so many stories. How can I not believe in the power of Jesus Christ when I've seen hundreds and hundreds of people being restored by Jesus Christ? We had a young man and a young lady in our church that had the call of God on their lives. And um, I was mentoring them. And this young man particularly, he had the call of leadership upon his life. He had a great business. He was in a security business. And um, in the security business, he was getting blessed. He was getting so blessed that I think something happened to him. Every time a speaker would come through, Many times he would get, him and his wife would get pulled out and they'd prophesy over them. You know, something's funny is when we live under blessing, sometimes we take it for granted. There's a danger when all of a sudden you, you live under blessing and you 
don't realise that it comes because of the grace of God. And somewhere along the line, he must have shifted his attention and his focus on himself. I think he took himself from under the grace of God and began to think that he was the one in control of his life. His wife was pregnant, and I can tell you this story because of its ending. But his wife was pregnant when he started having an affair with his secretary. And uh, after about four or five months, you can't hide those things. You can't hide sin. It comes out. And somebody caught him and he told his wife and then he thought, you know what? Uh, yep, I've been caught. I, um, I, I don't want to be married anymore. I don't love you. Now, this, this girl, his wife's pregnant. I mean, the heartache of this girl was, was tremendous. I mean, it was, it was so hurtful to us as pastors because we could see the call of God in his life. And we thought, what are you doing? And I pleaded with him. I said, do not throw your life away. His wife was amazing. She said, I will forgive you. And he said, no, I want to finish the marriage. So after a period of time, he divorced her. She had the baby. I was... I, I, I wish I could say to you that, you know, I was such a nice pastor, but I'll be honest with you, the Italian in me, the Italian mafia rose up and um, I wanted to sort of, you know, give him five, you know, the five hands of ministry. Do you know what I mean? Does anybody understand what I'm talking about? <laughs> and um, he got, re and, and his wife started coming to me and... Um, this was just before they got divorced and he started abusing her emotionally and trying to blame her that it was her fault. And I said, it's not your fault. And uh, he got really angry at me. And I got angry at him. Anyway, he divorces her. His wife was amazing. Now, this doesn't happen for everybody, but this young lady, there was something about her spirit. She said, God, I gave Jesus my heart and I made him my Lord. Even after he divorced her, she believed that he would come back. As a pastor, I'm going, honey, he's signed off. He's gone. Do you know, after he'd been divorced about six months, this affair that he was having... His, um, the girl, the lady, the secretary, left him. Not only did she leave him, but his business started going downhill. The, 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 the blessing of God came off of him. It was amazing. And all of a sudden, his business lost traction. He lost contracts. He, he was one of the biggest security, uh, had, had huge security contracts. Now he had to become, he had to go back on the field and become a security guard himself. He goes to live with his brother, his brother-in-law and sister because he, he's now got, he's now sort of destitute. His wife is still believing God and I want to tell you she had a lot more faith than what I did. Anyway, he comes to the bottom. He, he has a he has a prodigal son experience. He's with the, in the pig pen. And he goes living with his sister and brother-in-law. And one day, it was a very dark day for him, he shuts himself in the bedroom. He says, I've ruined my life. No one even cares for me. Why would anybody care for me? Why would anybody care for me? He pulled out his gun, put it to his head and he was about to do himself in when all of a sudden there was a knock on the door from his seven-year-old nephew, knocked on the door and said, Uncle Todd, Uncle Dodd, 
open the door. I love you. With those words, he just broke. He started weeping like anything. Just weeping, the sorrow and the grief because of what the sin had done to him. Do you know, that week he rang me. Now, I'd like to say to you that I'm a perfect pastor and that when he rang me, I was joyful and embracing. But when he rang me, he said, in a very humble tone, not like the last time we had the phone call, he said, hi, Pastor Nick, how are you? I was quite shocked by his call and surprised, but I was quite standoffish. I'm there, um, yes, hi, Todd, what can I do for you? He said, Pastor Nick, um, I have ruined my life. The worst thing I did was not only hurt my wife, but I turned my back on Jesus Christ. Now, right then and there, I, 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 you know, I just wanted to say, see, I told you, you should have listened to me. <laughs> I told you. I try to. I try to tell you. Thank God for the Spirit of Jesus. That stopped me from being like that, being arrogant. Because we're all sinners without the grace of God. And uh, I said, Todd. He said, I, and he he just began weeping. I said, Todd, come into the office. I've got another pastor. He was, he was truly repentant. You know, when, when you are truly repentant, God restores very, very quickly. <laughs> and um, the story of Luke 15, the prodigal son, that, that is an amazing story. So he came and we began to pray for him. Do you know, he was restored back to God, back to Christ, back to the church. And then he said, I haven't lost, I still love my wife. I think I always have. Now, you know, we had to take him on a journey of wisdom and, um, and restoration because he, he had to, you know, renew trust. And so they started courting again. Do you know they remarried? Isn't that a miracle? I think we should give God praise. And see, when I read this, when I read this about God's restoring power, he started dreaming again. They both did. They started laughing again. Man, you should have seen him in church on a Sunday. They started praising again. And all the tears that she had, that she had sown, now were being ripped. Do you know, it is amazing when we come back to Jesus Christ or when we come to Christ. Do you know, his business took off. You think the story doesn't end here. His business took off. Do you know, in the middle of this, while this was happening, we had planted another church, another part of our congregation. And um, this was an incredible thing. We started with 40 people and the church just kept growing. But the only problem is we couldn't find a permanent building. And, um, do you know, every time we thought we'd had a place that was permanent, they'd shut us down. We started in this place called the ballroom. And um, it, was, it was about as big as this. They had polished floors. And then they said to us, oh, you know, we, you're going to have to go out for three weeks because we have to polish the floors. So we went out for three weeks. Uh, but then when we were to come back, they said, look, because we polished the floors, you can't put chairs anymore. You can put bean bags down, but not chairs. And I thought, now we're going to have the first church of the bean bag. You know what I mean? I thought, really, Lord, really? So then we tried to find another building. Now, I was getting so frustrated because all these buildings we were finding, we used to have to set up and pack down, set up and pack down. One building we got, we had to walk upstairs. The, the, the lift didn't work. So we had to cart all our gear upstairs. And I was getting frustrated. And my wife, you know... She's the spiritual one. She says, why are you worried about buildings? God's building the church. Stop worrying about buildings. Did I listen to her? No, I didn't listen to her. I just got more frustrated. And then the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, 
just like Jericho was tightly shut, this city is tightly shut. And you're going to go through seven buildings until you find the right building. It wasn't really a comfort, I can tell you, because we were on about the fourth one when I heard it. Do you know, so Todd became very close to me. We helped him a lot. Now, Todd's security business was going through the roof. I said, Todd, surely with all the security places you, you know, do, there's got to be a building out there for us. If you hear of anything, please let us know. Now, he got this contract. If you ever come to Adelaide, he got this contract with what we call the showgrounds. The showgrounds uh, are, are run by, um, it's a, is it government? I think it's government. Is it, no, it's separate. It's a royal show. And it has huge buildings, but you can't, you can't hire them. It's just impossible to hire them because they're all for the show. And um, they, he, he, he saved them so much money that they gave him an office and he could do all his operations out of the showground. He just had to pay $1, that's 50 pence, a year to use the offices. How's that for the, for the grace of God? Who'd like that? So it's a dollar, one Australian dollar. Anyway, one day, he, he rings me I didn't get the message, but he, he recorded on my phone and it said this was the message. Meredith was with me and um, he left this message. He said, hi, Pastor Nick. There's a building that's just come available in the showgrounds. They don't know what to do with it. Actually, eventually, in about five years, they're planning to knock it down and build something new. It's just come available and I can't negotiate for you but if you ring this guy called Grant Piggott, he's actually the manager. If you can get an appointment with him, um, you might be able to get that building if you can get in quickly. So we heard this message and Meredith says to me, I think I went to school with a Grant Piggott. And I said, Meredith. Now, my wife comes from a little country town, three and a half hours out of Adelaide. When I met her, there was only 250 people. There's more sheep than people. So the chances of this man being the same man that went to school with her was like a million to one. I said, Meredith, it ain't going to happen. I'm guaranteeing that's a different guy. So I, made a point, I rang Mr Pickett and said, hi, Grant, my name's Nick. I said, Todd... Uh, who runs your security's room and said, there's a building that's possible you could, maybe you're looking to lease. And we're a church, uh, we're looking for a building in the city, we believe that you're going to, you know, you're, you're going to knock it down after five years. You know, is there any chance we could come and have a meeting with you? He goes, sure. She said, sure, let, let's get together. I said, by the way, Grant, you didn't happen to go to school in a place called Bullaroo Centre. He goes, yes, I did. I go, what? I said, do you remember? He goes, why do you ask me that? I said, do you remember a, a, a girl called Meredith Bishop? He goes, Meredith Bishop? Yeah, I sure did. He says, how do you know? I said, I married her. He said, you poor guy. <laughs> Apparently, he was, a, he was a maths, he was a bit of a brainy, and Meredith would always go and annoy him. How's that for a miracle? How's that for the combination of the redemptive hand of Jesus Christ. Do you know what? This is what I felt for your church. I felt that this place is a place of redemption. This house, God's house, we are the redeemed. And I'm go we're going to pray in a minute, we're going to pray that when people come through those doors, they're going to know the power of Jesus Christ, the redemptive power of Jesus Christ. And we're going to see people that are coming out of nightmares, their dreams in God are going to be realised. They're going to laugh again. They're going to praise again. They're going to start reaping for everything that the enemy has taken away from them. Can you, can you believe that with me tonight? And, and I really sense that. I also sense that I don't know why I've had this thought. I, I, you know, and time will tell. I know that you're believing for this building. 
But I believe you're going to get this building and I believe you're going to get another building which is going to be like your community centre. Even though you can run community things out of here, I see it in a different location. And it's like God says, enlarge the place of your tent. As I was praying today, I felt God gave me the scripture, Isaiah 54 two, Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch your tent curtains wide. For you will spread out to the left and the right. And I just sense, I don't know whether it'll be an op shop, something like that. I, I just think it'll be in a different location. Get ready for some miracles. Can you believe that with me? Get ready for some miracles because I believe you're going to see God do some amazing things. And the other thing that I prayed last night when we were having a bit of a leaders get together and, you know, it was up here before Isaiah 43, uh, 43, 18 and 19. Forget the past. Forget the past. God's going to do a brand new thing. What I love about the scripture, it says this, can't you perceive it? You know, perceiving is a sensing word. Did you know that before you see, you sense? Some of you are starting to sense things. You might not see it, but that's how the Holy Spirit works. You sense things first before you see it. And if you can follow that sensing and, and, and let that activate your faith, one day you're going to see it. <laughs> And I really believe that. This weekend, I think, will be a turning point for your church. I don't know why I sense that. I just sense that it, it, there's going to be something shift in the spiritual atmosphere of your church. And get ready. Last night while I was praying, we were just praying together, I, I, I felt like you're going to start seeing the ones and the twos just start to come. Just the ones and the twos, little by little. But then I think, you know what's going to happen? I just sense families are going to come. All of a sudden, you're going to get the fives. All of a sudden, two families. And they're going to experience this very, the redemption song. This is such a powerful psalm. Please go home and read it. Read it right over, right over Easter and pray it. Begin to pray it and believe God that you're going to see people come and as they surrender their life to Jesus Christ and his saving grace and his lordship you're going to see people dream again laugh again praise again and god's going to restore just like the story of todd and leanne you know that 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 impacted me so much it's just one of the stories of so many people that i've seen come to jesus christ what a story you can't make those things up meredith should write a book on it <laughs> It's an amazing story. And, you know, even on Friday when those two, that young couple, go into the water of baptism, pray that over them. Let them dream again. Let them laugh again. Let them praise again. God, restore the things that the enemy has taken from them. Is that, is that okay? And... Uh, we're going to believe that. I, I really believe that, um, you know, there has been some hard seasons. There's been some hard seasons. But there's something that happens in the timing of God. And I, and I just, I don't know why I sense this. I just sense there's a shift. I believe God's heard your cry. I believe he's heard your prayer. I believe this is going to be a church that is outward focused. I believe that you're going to see miracles. Can you believe that with me? Yeah. That you're going to see miracles. Yeah. And um, even tonight, even tonight, there was, a, there was a man that came and he just walked past. He said, oh, is there a meeting here tonight? Now, he didn't come in, but he was curious. Let's pray for curiosity <laughs> to bring him in. Is that all right? Now, I'd love tonight to pray for whoever wants prayer. I'm going to start off with a lady right at the back over there. And um, you're another one. You're another person who I believe God wants to connect with community. Do you know what I mean? I, I, I really do. You, 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 have a, you have incredible compassion for people. You know, and God's, you're going to have a lot of those spot moments that I talked about on, on Sunday. I really sense that. And I believe the Holy Spirit 
is going to really guide you. I, I, I want to ask you a question, if that's all right. Have you been filled with the Holy Spirit? Yeah, great. Just, just get ready, because I believe the Holy Spirit is going to become even more, he's going to become louder. And um, you're going to be sometimes even just, you know, walking past people, and he's going to speak to you about someone, and it's, it's going to arrest your attention so that you can help them. But he's also going to guide you, and he's going to give you wisdom and discernment. Because of what you, what you do and what you're going into, I believe that wisdom and discernment are going to be a great key for you. Is that all right? Could you come out the front and... So why don't we... Whoever would like prayer, would you like to come out the front? I'm going to get someone to get on the piano. I don't know whether Anne you want or Meredith wants to, whoever would like to do that. And here's the things that I'd, I'd like to pray for you for. Um, if you need a situation restored, there are some people I felt tonight... I felt that you've been praying, particularly those of you that are praying for family members. If, if that's you, I'd like to pray with you tonight. I believe, I want to stand with you to believe for a miracle. Could, could, you, could you believe with us? I, just come out the front here if that's all right. If you're believing for family members, then maybe come on this side because I want to pray for you. Now, my father didn't give his life to Jesus Christ till he was 72. He was a very stubborn man. I grew up in a family where my mother was a Christian, but my father wasn't. There was always tension. When I, I asked my dad, I said, Dad, I want to go into Bible college. He nearly, he, he was so angry. Uh, but what was worse is when um, I went into full-time ministry he would lie to people. He would tell people that I worked in a bank because he was so embarrassed. He said, I can't tell them the truth. And I thought, God, how are you going to grab a hold of my dad? And you know what? God sets things up because he loves us. And, um, do you know, he was, it was at a funeral that God got my dad's attention. He went to his cousin's funeral, Christian funeral, and the pastor said this. He said, as he's closing, he said, Luciano, which was my father's cousin, he said, Lu you know, when you go to another nation, you need a passport signed by the authority of the land so you can enter. He said, the same is true about the kingdom of God. He said, to enter the kingdom of God, you need a passport signed with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And he said, have you got your passport? It was like an arrow just hit my dad. It wasn't much longer than that that dad gave his life to Jesus Christ. Now, here's the thing. If there was hope for my dad, there's hope for you, whoever you're believing for. So we're going to pray with you. Yeah.